Every day in Britain, somebody somewhere unearths treasure. I'd never found gold before, and it, and it was just uh, amazing. It was about 800 years old and probably the best find ever. Objects left behind by our ancestors that tell us who we are and how we once lived. These are Britain's secret treasures. where every year you, the British public, record over 70,000 of the precious objects that you found with the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And each and every one of those objects has a story to tell. Things don't have to be gold and silver to be precious. We all have objects that are dear to us because of their sentimental value. Tonight we have treasures from history that celebrate or commemorate a moment in someone's life and that reveal a common connection between us and the lives of our ancestors. In tonight's show, an 18th century ring with a tragic tale. So she's only a day old when she dies? She is, yes. Horoscopes, Roman style. He was told that he would become the most powerful leader the world had ever known. And a pendant that unlocks love across conflict. These are the only two that we have in this yes, country. Yes. Now, our first item is an 800-year-old badge. It was found in Scotland, but it's got a design that could be seen right across Britain today. Today, the question of an independent Scotland, breaking the ties that have united Britain for hundreds of years, is back. Now it's going to be answered by a vote, a referendum to be held here next year. In the past, it was answered by battle, with warriors like William Wallace and Robert the Bruce passing into Scottish legend. Today, I'm investigating a treasure that sheds a new light on the turbulent relationship between these two great nations. Here in Galloway, a chance discovery was made in the ruins of an old monastery. Fraser Richardson is a postman, but he spends his free time looking for artefacts. It was while searching near Kirkubri that he found what looked like a small badge. Put this shovel in, dug it out. It was about six inches down. When I cleaned it a wee bit, and I seen the red enamel in, and I thought, this must be pretty good find, this one. Uh, so I didn't clean it anymore, put it back in my pouch and went to the museum that day and uh, they found out it was about 800 years old and uh, probably the best find ever. When the experts had a look at it, they found something truly remarkable beneath the dirt. I've come to the Stuart Museum to take a look for myself. <laughs> well, David, what is it? Well, Michael, it is a, a little heraldic badge, and it's the, the three lions of the Royal Arms of England. What Fraser Richardson had found was one of the oldest depictions of the three lions of England ever discovered, the same three lions that still wear pride of place on the England shirts. It would originally have had a nice deep red background, you can see some traces of the red enamel. The lions themselves would probably have been gilded, so imagine a yellow or gold on red. As a panel, it would be fitted to a perhaps a leather bag, a leather satchel, and it would be clearly identify that object as part of the royal household. And there was only one royal household this could have come from, King Edward I's. The three lions were his insignia. Nicknamed the Hammer of the Scots, in the early 1300s, he was at war with one William Wallace of Scotland. But what's so strange is that this badge was found deep inside Scotland, far from where the battles took place. And it tells us something extraordinary about Edward I. Richard Oram has a theory. He's here, he's moving about, he's on horseback, and things like that can easily detach. 
it could come off his own personal harness. This is enemy territory at the time of a war. What, what, what might he have been doing? Right from the beginning of the war, he has been trying to, to detach people from loyalty to one side and bring them across to, to his side. This was a dangerous and daring tactic. It seems that Edward I may well have been risking his own life to try and negotiate with the Scots. It'd be a bit like Barack Obama personally talking to the Taliban in Afghanistan. The badge that Fraser found is the only physical evidence in existence that strongly suggests King Edward I may have risked his life to enter enemy territory and talk to the Scots. Unfortunately, the war continued, even after his death. What does it mean to you as a medieval historian to actually be able to see, maybe even hold, something like this? Getting something like that um, out of this particular period, out of a war, where you know, this is raging over a huge territory, and yet you know, here is an object that one of the leading figures in that war dropped. This is a truly amazing find. It really is one of the great discoveries of the last few years, and our finder, Fraser Richardson, is rightly proud. It's quite something to find an object in a field that just might have belonged to a king, and if it did, what it tells us about Edward I's bravery. Fascinating, too, to find out why three lions became the national symbol. Our next item also reveals the deep roots of much of modern-day life, only this time it's astrology, which, as Russell Grant reveals, played a key part in the life of this Roman emperor. One day, over 2,000 years ago, a teenager went to have his horoscope read. He was told that he would become the most powerful leader the world had ever known. In 2011, husband and wife Peter and Elizabeth Andrews were walking on the Mendip Hills in Somerset when they found something very beautiful but very strange. A small figure made of bronze and perfectly preserved. One end depicted a goat, the other a fish's tail. I'm going to the Museum of Somerset to have a look. Oh, goodness. This is immaculate, it isn't is. it? It's fabulous. Nothing's so been broken? No, nothing nothing at all. It looks it looks complete. Look at the cloven yeah, so feet. Yes, we've got the cloven feet. That's incredible. We've got the scales on the fish part of the body. We've got the, the fur down his neck. Now, I am one of those astrologers for whom the goat and fish combination is very familiar. Capricorn is the... Oh, the best sign you could possibly be if you want to rule and you want to be a politician, if you want to be a smooth operator. Mm. But of course, negative Capricorn could be an autocrat, a dictator right. as right. well. Right. You've got to look at people perhaps like with strong Capricorn influences, Mao Zedong, mm. Stalin, Richard Nixon. And perhaps the greatest of them all, the first emperor of Rome, Augustus. Augustus was the founder of the Roman Empire and its very first emperor. He ruled for almost 40 years from 31 BC to 14 AD. Single-handedly, he transformed Rome from a republic into a de facto dictatorship, and his belief in his horoscope played an important role in his achievements. The sign of Capricorn, he puts it on his coins, he puts it on jewellery that's commissioned to, to commemorate his, his reign. And from his use of it, the sign travels out through Roman art. Other people put it on their houses, on their tombs as an auspicious symbol. So it has that imperial connection. But there was just one slight problem. Augustus was not a Capricorn at all. His actual sun sign was Libra, known to epitomise balance, harmony and a sense of fair play. These qualities were not exactly in keeping with being a ruthless Roman emperor. So Augustus had done what every dictator could do. He simply swapped sides. 
But how did our figurine end up in Britain? Enthusiast and expert Dave Richardson, who loves wearing a toga almost as much as the Romans, thinks he has the answer. Every legion formed or reformed by the Emperor Augustus has somewhere in its iconography a Capricorn. And you'll find as an emblem on the second Augustus shields, we find a Capricorn emblazoned on it. What about then the Capricorn here? Would that have been something that the, the ordinary Roman soldier would have looked up at and seen as a good luck symbol? With its connection to, to Augustus himself, yes. These emblems, these images were revered to the point of, of, of them almost being a religious icon. The legion followed the standards to the very death. And that's probably how our Capricorn figurine got here. It is a star exhibit at the Museum of Somerset, who raised the £16,000 needed to acquire it. It's not surprising that our lovely Capricorn has survived, because it would have been greatly cherished. So, next time you read your horoscope in the paper and hope for good news, remember that your Roman ancestors were doing exactly the same thing over 2,000 years ago. The only difference is that you don't get to choose your own sun sign. Coming up, a pendant that unlocks love across conflict. I'd never found gold before, and it was just amazing. And a beautiful ring with a heartbreaking story. So Mary's died in childbirth, and this little baby, Sarah, hasn't made it either. No. Welcome back to Britain's Secret Treasures. This is the Fishpool Hoard, currently on display here at the British Museum. It's a spectacular set of medieval treasure, with a curious link to our next story. Historian Susanna Lipscomb investigates... This is Rolleston, Nottinghamshire. Five years ago, in these fields, Darren Hoyle found an unexpected and beautiful treasure. What did you think when you saw it? Did you know what it was? I didn't at all. I'd never seen anything like it, to be honest. Just saw a glint of gold, and I'd never found gold before, and it, and it was just uh, amazing. What did it look like? It's a small square oblong, slightly smaller than a new five pence piece. Once I rubbed the dirt off it and had a look, I didn't really know what it was. What Darren had found was a small gold locket with some intriguing writing on it. I want to see it for myself, so I'm going to the British Museum, who acquired it for £4,000. This is the locket that was found in Rolleston. Isn't it beautiful? It's so delicate. It's very tiny, yes. It's very beautiful. And exactly how would this have been worn? It would have been suspended on a chain, much as we would wear a locket on a chain today. It is inscribed on both sides in French with the inscription uh, Sans Repentir, without regret or without repentance. The experts dated this unusual locket to the 15th century and the time of the War of the Roses, but at first it was a bit of a mystery. That was until it was compared to an older find. The so-called Fishpool Hoard, discovered 50 years before. The Fishpool Hoard is one of the greatest treasure finds ever made in Britain. And it was discovered just round the corner from Rolleston by workmen on a building site. Consisting of 1,237 gold coins, four gold rings and two lengths of gold chain, which in today's money would be worth over £300,000. It also contained a single gold locket. This is from the Fishpool Hoard, and it's the same form but slightly larger, and it still has its key attached. And it also has a French inscription on both sides, which reads, De tout mon coeur, with all my heart or of all my heart. How wonderful, it's mm. so romantic. Mm. Could these two lockets, found in different places, have once belonged to the same lovers? The great thing about the Fishpool Hoard is that the dates on the coins mean we know almost exactly when it was buried. And it's these dates that may hold the answer. We think it was buried early in the year 1464, either before or after the Battle of Hexham, which was part of the Wars of the Roses. And it's thought to possibly have belonged to um, a member of the Lancastrian 
um, faction. The War of the Roses was an ongoing 30-year struggle between the House of York and the House of Lancaster to seize the throne of England. And there are many stories of illicit love affairs between the two opposing families. One involves a Yorkist by the name of John Neville, who fell in love with a Lancastrian Isabel Ingersthorpe in 1465. But when the affair was discovered, he was imprisoned and threatened with execution. It was a risky business. Lockets like these were one way of keeping a forbidden love affair secret. Is there any scenario in which these two might be tokens of love that were exchanged? There are inventories um, and wills which show that people um, bequeathed or gave them as gifts to their husbands and wives. It is intriguing that they were found so close together and they're the only two that survive. These are the only two that we have in this yes, country? Yes, yes. We can't be sure that they come from two lovers, but they were found 10 miles apart. They look so similar, perhaps worked by the same goldsmith. And then, of course, there are those romantic messages. Perhaps they make up one sentence, with all my heart, without regret. It just goes to show that despite everything else that changes through the ages, the power of love remains a constant thing. Until relatively recently, childbirth was incredibly risky. And if you became pregnant, then you diced with death. Our next item reveals one family's heartbreaking story. In 2005, in Bridgenorth, Shropshire, local enthusiast Tony Baker uncovered a very beautiful and mysterious ring. What made you decide to come and look around here? Well, I was actually living and working in the area. Um, and Albury is also mentioned in the Doomsday Book. There's this history in the fields. It's a tiny thing, though, a ring. So how hard was it to find? Gold, it doesn't tarnish or anything. So I, as soon as it came out of the ground covered in dirt, I knew it was gold. When I got home and cleaned it up, it was really quite special. Tony could then read the letters around the band. Mary and Sarah Littleton. OB died 7th of June, 1735. Two names on a ring is unusual, unless they're husband and wife. Tony was intrigued and decided to try to find out who Sarah and Mary Littleton might be. I went on the internet, as most people do, and came across a, a, a marriage of a Mary, uh, Mary Phillips and a Thomas Littleton, married in uh, 1731. And from that, I found out that uh, the church behind us, he was actually rector there for 50 years. But what about Sarah? Well, that was, that was the next step in the research, to try and find out exactly what had happened and why the ring was made. Tony then spent weeks searching through the church records for June 1735 to see if he could find any mention of the name Sarah Littleton. And eventually, he found the names of both Mary and Sarah in the births and deaths register. This is a copy from the church records, uh, dated 1735. And then down here, we've got the entries uh, confirming the death of his wife and daughter. And it reads, Sarah, the daughter of Thomas Littleton Clark, and Mary, his wife, baptized the 7th of June. And then underneath, Mary, his wife, and Sarah, his daughter, of Thomas Littleton Clark, buried the 8th of June. 1735. So Mary's died in childbirth, and this little baby, Sarah, hasn't made it either. Yeah. Terrible. In 24 hours, he lost his wife and his daughter. In the 18th century, one in five women died in childbirth, and over 12% of all newborns would die within the year. At this time, male doctors weren't allowed to attend, Midwives and friends helped to deliver babies. There were no anaesthetics available. It all took place at home, and if there were complications at birth, there was very little that could be done. Tragedies were common. When you see it in writing like that, it's, uh, it's, it's very tragic, it really is. I mean, so these are the records from, from Thomas's own church, aren't they? Yes, yeah. He's down as a minister down there. I'm just wondering whether he's actually done the entry of his own wife and daughter, which would be quite, uh, quite moving if he, did, if he did. 
This little ring was made so that Thomas's wife and his day-old daughter would never be forgotten. Today, we have wedding rings to commemorate the day we exchange marriage vows. But from the Middle Ages, it was also customary for relatives to remember the day someone had died by wearing a mourning ring inscribed with the name and date of death. By finding it, Tony's shed light on a heart-rending tradition. And also, in fact, 300 years on, he's also ensured that Mary and little Sarah will always be remembered. Next time, a gold cameo found at the bottom of the sea. They were exceptionally excited about it because they couldn't believe the condition it was in. And we bring the music of Bronze Age Britain back to life. Very striking, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I know. If you'd like to find out more about the fascinating treasures featured in this and the first series, the Britain's Secret Treasures book is available now. Or visit britishmuseum.org forward slash secret treasures. Will Mulligan really leave Elizabeth and her family alone? He's got some big demands in Breathless tonight. The drama continues here on ITV Next, while Ben Hanlon's conjuring up more mischief and frightening a few famous faces on ITV2. Well, it is Halloween in Tricked. And on ITV3, next, Joanna Lumley heads off to the mythical home of the gods, Mount Olympus, on her Greek odyssey. Potato.